Hello. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much for watching, for tuning in. This is an unlisted video on my channel. Trust me when I say that I've been reading the Bible a lot to try and find some kind of explanation or evidence for a lot of the details surrounding the mud flood. In particular, I mean evidence of architecture that was previously inhabited by another group of people, a larger group of people, and by that I mean giants. So giants is also something I've been looking at in the Old Testament, as well as evidence of resets and widespread destruction of the cities and towns on Earth. These all relate to topics that people are discussing with regard to mud flood. Just briefly, I think I've found some interesting things in the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible, particularly Exodus. Um, but I've just had such a challenge in putting all this information together, making it coherent for people listening. and I'm not 100% sure of the suspicions I have about the book of Exodus and Numbers and Genesis. So, anyway, I thought, well, I better just focus in on a small part of the puzzle. So I thought, well, I'll just make something very simple. Let's look at giants, the existence of giants. I don't want to make a complicated video, let's just make it simple. And I want to ask the question, where is the evidence in the Bible where it mentions <coughs> giants? <coughs> and I didn't spend a whole lot of effort going through the Bible and looking for the quotes, and people have already done this. So here's a website that came up on a Google search, which I'm hoping I will just point out all the major quotes in the Bible which mention giants. Uh, I am somebody who reads the Bible on a regular basis. I have been for the last eight years or so, like every day. Not a lot of the Bible, but I read it every day. And so I'm no, I know that like the New Testament doesn't really cover giants, not not to my knowledge, but the Old Testament, particularly the first five books of the, of the Bible, does. Particularly Exodus, where the Israelites go from Egypt to the new land of Canaan, and when they get to Canaan, uh, there's like all kinds of different groups. There's the Amorites, the Canaanites, and a bunch of other tribes, I'm forgetting now, that are already there in the land. And they're afraid, because they're like, these people are big, uh, and they're settled, and how are we supposed to conquer these people? And the Lord says to Moses that he will uh, help them conquer the existing inhabitants and this will be the promised land. Well, that actually has some similarity and that is kind of a precedent in the Bible for the topic of mud flood. Like, well, not mud flood, but like civilization reset and repopulation. Okay, I've gone off on a tangent. I didn't even mean to make a big long introduction. So just, I'm going to get reading this. I haven't read this yet. I talk too much. Okay, this is from AnswersInGenesis.org, Answers in Depth, and it's talking about Giants in the Old Testament by Tim Chaffee, and it's from February 22, 2012. Uh, before I start, I know that if you read the book of Enoch, there is mention of giants. If you read the Nag Hammadi Gnostic texts, which I'm not 100% sure I know what to make of, but that actually has very uh, specific mention in some of the books contained in the Nag Hammadi of giants. It even mentions them in the title of some of the books. Well, uh, I think I'm going to have to narrow my focus down to just the Old Testament or the Tanakh if you're if you're Jewish okay if 
five minutes in, and only now am I reading. Okay, Giants in the Old Testament. Introduction. The Bible describes many individuals as giants, and it also mentions several giant people groups. Interpreters have speculated about the size of these people, with guesses ranging anywhere from six feet to more than 30 feet in height. Also, a great deal of misinformation about biblical giants has been proliferated on the internet along with some fake pictures of supposed giants. So did these giants really exist? If so, how big were they? This article surveys all of the individuals and people groups described as giants in scripture. Next, some ancient records and archaeological data that corroborate some of the biblical data will be examined. The article can Includes with a study of how big these people could have been based on what we currently understand about genetics and biology. Old Testament Giants One of the earliest mentions of giants in scripture is found in Genesis number 14 or chapter 14. <clears throat> in the 14th year Cador Leomer and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephaim in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, <coughs> the Zuzim in Ham, the Amim in Shaveh, Kiriathayam, and the Horites in their mountain of Seir. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites, and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hazazon Tamar, Genesis 14, 5 to 7, emphasis added. Well, let's actually look at that. Okay, so I looked it up on Bible Gateway, Genesis 14, verses 5 to 7. And in the fourteenth year came Chador Lomer and the kings that were with him, and smote the Rephaims in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Amims in Shaveh Kiriathaim, and the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. My goodness, do I ever want to talk about the wilderness, and some suspicions I have that it's actually a place and not just a word. Well, I won't go off on a tangent. And they returned and came to En Mishpat, which is Kadesh and smote all of the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelled in Hazaz on Tamar. Hazaz on Tamar. I guess I'll just read the next one. And there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Admah and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela the same is Zoar and the joined battle with them in the Vale of Sedim. Okay, I looked it up on Google. A Vale is a valley. means the same thing. Okay, so back to this website. Again, Genesis 14 does not reveal that the Rephaim, Zuzim, Emim, or Amorites were giants, but this information can be found in other places. The Amorites are mentioned before excuse me the Amorites are mentioned more than 80 times in scripture and early on some were allied with Abraham if we re read Genesis 14 13 now I just gonna read it and there came one that had escaped and told Abraham or Abram the Hebrew for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, Amorite, in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eskol and brother of Aner, and these were confederate with Abram. They were descendants of Noah's grandson, Canaan, which is mentioned in Genesis 10, 15 to 16. And here's Genesis 10, Genesis 10, 15 to 16. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, and the Jebu Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the
and what does it say? And the Jebusite and the Amorite and the Girgasite and the Hivite and the Archite and the Sinite. Okay, just because I was reading the ver verses, I'm going to start again. The Amorites, the Amor the Amorites are mentioned more than 80 times in scripture and early on some were allied with Abraham. They were descendants of Noah's grandson Canaan. That's a little confusing because Canaan is a place and Canaan is the promised land of the Israelites. Although the well that's in Exodus. Although the Bible does not provide this information, the Jewish general turned historian Josephus gives the name of their ancestor as Amorius. While the Amorites are mentioned in the same contexts as other giants a few times, they are specifically described as giants in the Minor Prophets. So this is from the book of Amos. Yet it was, yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them whose height was like the height of the cedars. And he was as strong as the oaks, yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you forty years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. Once again, I'm interested in this word. I'll maybe cover it later. Well, since the quote was here, I won't go looking for it again, although it's not King James. Through Amos, God clearly stated that the Amorites were generally very tall and strong. Some may downplay the description of the Amorites in this passage, since these verses employ figurative language, but there are some good reason to take it to take this passage in a straightforward manner. The idea that the Amorites were giants is supported by the report of the spies who Moses sent through the land of Canaan. The Amorites were one of the people groups they saw, and that's in Numbers. Well, let's look it up. Okay, so it was talking about uh, Numbers 13 verse 29 the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites and Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan okay so back to this article I'll start that sentence again the Amorites were one of the people groups they saw I'll start the paragraph again the idea that the Amorites were giants is supported by the report of the spies who Moses sent through the land of Canaan. The Amorites were one of the people groups they saw, and they claimed that all the people whose, whom he saw in it are men of great stature. I won't go back. Well, one second. It is telling that in their response, Joshua and Caleb did not challenge the size of the, in, of the land's inhabitants. Okay, so here's one of those quotes. So this is the people they saw in Canaan, in the land. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. To me, this is a, this is a note to self I will say it slowly. Often I talk too fast. But if Moses, who sent his spies before the Israelites into Canaan to scope it out, and then so we see that they're just almost for the first time taking notice that there's giants there, men of big stature, great stature. Thank you for the comment. I will read that later. Then
I think we can assume that before Moses and the Israelites sent spies into Canaan, it would seem that they had no foreknowledge that such men of giant stature, and probably women maybe, were living there. Now let's just say Egypt, for argument's sake, let's just say this Egypt and Canaan are the same as the present ones we find on maps today. So we're talking about Egypt and just over the Red Sea. Then it's a little bit strange that they would not have heard that there were large people living such a short distance away. I mean, I think we're talking within... Oh, just off the top of my head, 500 kilometers. So let's just say you live in Egypt. Maybe Cairo, just for argument's sake. Wouldn't you know that, you know, within 500 kilometers there's giants over there? For whatever reason, Moses has no foreknowledge nor do the Israelites have foreknowledge that giants live in that land. Why wouldn't that be something you know? I mean, I know this is perhaps before technology, before internet, before news. This is biblical times. Conventional understanding would say that they didn't have that technology. But wouldn't they still know if there's giants living over there? Wouldn't the giants occasionally come over to Egypt, say hi, show up, walk around and then go back home? No? It's as if the Israelites and Moses had no clue that there's giants over in that land. They had to scope it out. So, to me this is a clue that maybe, maybe, Egypt, or Biblical Hebrew, doesn't call it Egypt, it calls it Mitz, Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim, maybe Mitzrayim is in a different realm. Moses has to part the sea to get there. Does Moses cross the sea floor to get there? To the other side of the river? Of the sea? What if the river has to be parted so that Moses goes down below through the earth? Is that crazy? Because when the Moses and the Israelites go through the Red Sea, they come into a new land. They come into the wilderness, and they have to go through the wilderness to get to the promised land, which is Canaan. Hmm. Okay, so this, this article is saying that Joshua and Caleb did not challenge the size of the land's inhabitants. It's talking about the Amorites and the people in Canaan. So, uh, going to look at Bible Gateway, chapter 14 of Numbers, verses 6 to 9. I will try to read this through quickly. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. That means tore them. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we passed through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, give it to us, give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. That's a very often quoted verse. Only the rebel, not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. What's that saying? In the New International Version, that last verse says, Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not 
protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Okay, so back to this article. It's starting a new paragraph, a brand new idea. Deuteronomy 2 reveals that the Amim, which likely means terrors, were giants. The Amim had dwelt there in times past, a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. They were also regarded as giants, Hebrew Rephaim, like the Anakim, but the Moabites call them Amim, Deuteronomy 2, verses 10 and 11. Okay, so this is Deuteronomy 2, 10 and 11. So I will just read. The Amims dwelt there in times past, a people great and many and tall, as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Amims. All right, so back to this article. It says, regarding the Amim, Moses told the people that the Amim used to live in the territory that God had given to the descendants of Lot's son, Moab. And I'm going to look this up on Bible Gateway. It's verse 37. I have that right? Oops. I have verse 37. <coughs> And the firstborn and the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. The same is the father of the Moabites unto this day. Okay, well who are the Moabites? Um, I don't know that they're the Israelites. I don't think they are. Uh, just from memory, they actually come from the aftermath of Sodom and Gomorrah. I have to look that up again. Okay, next paragraph. The Zuzim. Zam Zuzi Zam Zumim. The Zam Zumim, almost certainly the same as the Zuzim in Genesis 14, verses 5, were also called giants and listed in the same chapter as the Amim. Well, since the quote is here, I'll just read this. The land of Ammon was also regarded as a land of giants, Hebrew Rephaim. Giants Rephaim formerly dwelt there, but the Ammonites called the Zemzumim a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before them and dispossessed them and dwelt in their place. We already read Deuteronomy 2. Okay, here's that Genesis 14 verses five quote again already read this and in the fourteenth year came Chordor Lamer and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephaims which are giants in Ashtaroth which is actually a deity's name I won't go into that Karnaim and the Zuzims in Ham and the Yamims in Shaveh Kiriathaim Okay, so back to the article. According to Genesis 14.5, which I just read, the Zuzim were in the land of Ham. This may be in reference to Noah's son, Ham, or Ham, since they descended from him. But it is more likely a reference to the Hamathites, who were descendants of Canaan, Ham's son. Well, the Zuzim and Zamzuzim, Zamzumim, may have been different people groups, there are enough similarities in name, description, and geographical location to infer that they were variant names for the same group. Raphaim. The most common term used to describe giants in the Bible is Raphaim. Example, Deuteronomy 3, verses 11 to 13. Okay, so I looked up on Blue Letter Bible, Deuteronomy 3, verses 11, and one second. Okay, here's here's Deuteronomy 3, verses 11. I'll read it. For only Og, king of Bashan... This guy's actually a giant. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabath?
Sorry, you folks aren't going to like that. Okay, yeah, it's the free trial software. I, I tried other software, I couldn't get a decent one, I just kept going with the free one I had. Whatever. Sorry, some people don't some people don't like that. Okay, for only Og, King of Bashan, remained in the remnant of giants. Remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Raboth of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. Remember hearing somewhere like a cubit is about a uh, forearm's length? I could be wrong about that, though. I should look that up. I just wanted, I just looked this up because I wanted to see what the word for giants is. And we, and one of the most commonly used words in the Bible for giants is Raphaim. And here's our Aresh, Pei, Olive, Yod, Mem. Raphaim. Well, now that I'm thinking of it, the word Melech or Melech is actually the word for angel, and it also gets translated as king. Well, that's worth mentioning, I think, because this Og of Bashan is like a king of this area. He's the only remnant. I guess that's a word called Yether. Yeter? Yatar? But anyway, is he like an angel? Or a king? Or both? Maybe we'll get to looking at that more, but there's the Nephilim mentioned in Genesis, which are like fallen angels that come to the earth, <coughs> and they mated with the daughters of women, and they gave birth to giants. So is it so ridiculous to associate the word Melech, or like an angel, with a king in the land, who's also a Raphaim, which is a giant? All right, back to this, <coughs> back to this article. The most common term used to describe giants in the Bible is Raphaim, with the example I just read. It may refer to a certain people group, or it may be a term that simply means giants. The singular form, Rapha, also appears several times in Samuel. Second Samuel. Well, I won't go searching for it, but like the quote does show up from the ESV version, and Ishbi Banab, one of the descendants of the giants, whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze, so we can actually judge the, the weight of the spear. We can maybe infer his height if we can figure out what his spear weighed. But anyway, whose spear weighed 300 shekels of bronze and who was armed with a new sword thought to kill David. What are the other quotes in Second Samuel? After there was again a war with the Philistines of Gob, then Sibachai and Hushathite struck down Saph, who was one of the descendants of the giants. <coughs> so descendants of giants. So are these like hybrid people? I don't know. In Second Samuel, and there was again war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature, a giant, who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in number, and he also was descended from the giants. All right. So I actually came across that before on someone else's YouTube channel talking about giants. Yeah, they had six fingers. Well, at least some of them did. All right. The third chapter of Deuteronomy contains an interesting account of the victory of the Israelites over Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and Og, the king of Bashan. It is here that we learn an intriguing detail about Og. For only Og, king, or Melech, angel, of Bashan remained of the remnant of the giants, Raphaim. Indeed, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. Is it not Rabbah of the people of Ammon, nine cubits its length and four cubits its width, according to the standard cubit?
This tells us something as well, which might be an important detail. If this Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants, then can we say that maybe the giants were wiped out? I mean, even the story of Exodus, with Moses going into Canaan with his spies, and then they're like horrified, saying, why did the Lord send us into this land with these giants? How, the, how do we possibly eliminate the giants and take their land? Why did the Lord do this to us? And they don't really have faith. And then I think the Lord actually destroys a certain part of the Israelites for not having faith. It doesn't quite, the story doesn't quite go like that. But I think that happens, just having read Exodus and Numbers. But anyway, yeah. Were there giants? And then they were wiped out? Because it says Og of Bashan was like one of the only remaining remnants. I think we came across that in a previous quote. <coughs> Forgive me if you're listening to this and you're like thinking to yourself, why, why doesn't he just read the article and stop adding his own input? Well, I, I'm actually studying this material for the sake of creating a more complete video. So these are just my thoughts. They're kind of notes to self. I know that could be irritating to listen to, but I'm trying to come up with something to deliver on my channel that people can use as a reference. Okay, some, some translations use the word sarcophagus, neb, or tev, or sev, in place of bedstead, for the Hebrew word eres. I wonder if that's like earth, like eretz. The majority of English Bibles render this term bed or bedstead, which makes sense since eres means couch, divan, bed or bedstead. Also, it would be indeed strange to translate it as sarcophagus since these were made of stone or marble, and Og's bedstead was made of iron. Barzai, remember that was the word that came up in Blue Letter Bible. Barzai, that means iron. Oh, I've lost my spot. Okay, whether Moses referred to Og's bed or coffin is not particularly relevant to the discussion at hand. However, the size of this object is noteworthy. We are told that it was nine cubits long and four cubits in width according to the standard cubit. Since the standard, standard cubit is approximately 18 inches long, so that's as long as your forearm, kind of correct, then Og's bed or coffin was about 13.5 feet long and six feet wide. So now we're getting the height of Og, I suppose. So to put this in perspective, if stood on end, the height of this bed would have been exactly twice as tall as a person who is six foot nine inches tall. Of course, he may not have been as large as his bed. Some authors have attempted to downplay the significance of these dimensions, but the Bible clearly identifies Og as a giant. The Nephilim the earliest mention in scripture of giants is just prior to the flood account. Interesting, because a flood wipes things out, I think, unless you get on Noah's Ark. So, Nephilim, were they wiped out? A race of giants that actually were wiped out. And then, I don't know, is Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy, is that post-flood? If it is, then you have giants at that time. So it would almost indicate that, well, if you had Nephilim that were wiped out of the flood, then maybe the earth was repopulated with giants as well after the flood. Just saying. These were giants, Nephilim, on the earth. Well, I'm going to start again. The Nephilim. The earliest mention in scripture of giants is just prior to the flood account. There were giants, Nephilim, on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men of who were of old, men of renown. Genesis 6 verses 4. Okay, here's Genesis 6 verses 4. There were giants in the earth in those days 
and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bore children to them the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown okay the word translated as giants in this verse is the Hebrew word Nephilim and many Bible versions simply transliterate it as such this has been much de there has been much debate over the meaning of this word some believe it comes from the Hebrew verb nephal like I guess nephilim while others claim that it is from the Aramaic noun nephil I know Aramaic and Hebrew are like almost the same language not quite anyway these individuals are described in Hebrew as giborim giborim mighty men. The Nephilim were mentioned again when the spies returned from their exploratory mission of the land of Canaan. So this is in Exodus. Moses, Before Moses brings the Israelites into Exodus, excuse me, into Canaan, he sends like scouts, spies. They call them. Go check out what's over there. Come back to us. Then we'll send the people over. Right? The Nephilim were mentioned again when the spies returned from their exploratory mission of the land of Canaan. These men reported that Ahimon, Sheshai, and Talmai, descendants of Anak, progenitor of the Anakim, dwelt in Hebron. They also stated the people who dwell in the land are strong, the cities are fortified, and very large. Be Starforts? Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. We already looked at this verse, I think. The chapters. The chapter concludes with ten of the spies giving a bad report, trying to convince the Israelites that they could not conquer the land. Who read this? I'll just read what it says here. The land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size there also we saw the Nephilim the sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim and we became like grasshoppers in our sight and so we were in their sight so I guess they were spotted the Anakim the Anakim mentioned in several of these passages. They were perhaps the best known of the giants dwelling in the land of Canaan at the time of the Exodus. As stated in the verse above, they were part of the Nephilim. If Nephilim simply refers to giants in general, then the Anakim are just said to be giants in Numbers 13 verses 33, which is consistent with their description in this passage. So the Amorites and other giant people would also be Nephilim. If Nephilim refers to a particular giant tribe, then the Anakim were part of this line. Numbers 13.22 states that Ahimon, Sheshai, and Talmai were descendants of Anak, who was obviously the namesake of the Anakim. Both the Amim, Zamzumim, were compared to the Anakim, as they were both a people as great and numerous and tall as the Anakim. Anak was the son of Arba. Oh, I came across the word Arba before in that uh, Deuteronomy 3.11 quote. It says Arba is just the number four. Here's Arba. Anak was the son of Arba in Joshua 15.13. Little is known about Arba and his ancestry is not provided. However, he was apparently somewhat legendary, as indicated by the parenthetical statements in the text when his name appears. The city of Hebron, where Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob settled and were buried, was also called Kiriath Arba. We are told that Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim, that's in Joshua, <coughs> and the father of Anak, which is Joshua 15. Kirjath Arba was also called Mamre, in Genesis 35:27. Okay, 
Kirjoth Arba was also called Mamre in Genesis 35:27. Mamre was an Amorite who was an ally of Abram, Abraham. This man owed, owned some trees by which Abram settled, and at some point part of Hebron became synonymous with his name. Joshua fought several battles with the Anakim and the Amorites. Eventually he cut off the Anakim from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, from all the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. None of the Anakim <coughs> were left in the land of the children of Israel. They remained only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod. And that's a reference in Joshua. These actions set the stage for the famous account of Goliath in 1 Samuel. I think it's worth mentioning, and I'm going to try to get to this later as a separate video, hopefully, is that this idea of children of Israel is interesting. Because, go back to Moses. I'm not going to recount the story of Exodus. But the Israelites, along with Moses, leave Egypt, or really it's called Mitzrayim. They go through the wilderness, what's that, 40 years, and then they come to the land of Canaan. So when we use a word like children of Israel, could this quite literally mean the children of Israel? So if you're going to wander for 40 years, well, do the old people who originally go through the wilderness all survive? So then you would have children of Israel. You wouldn't have the originally original Israelites. You would have their children. 40 years later, they get to Canaan. Now that's something I really want to talk about. <coughs> because, watch the Conspiracy R Us video talking about orphans, orphan trains. All children. So who inhabits the new land in Canaan? In, in the biblical account. Children. The children of Israel. The progeny of Israel. The, the offspring. The next generation. They're all children. So when it says children of Israel, maybe it means exactly that. The children of the Israelites who left Egypt. These actions set the stage for the famous account of Goliath in 1 Samuel. So this is the David and Goliath story. Most people have probably heard of this, even if you don't go to church or read the Bible or are a Christian or even Jewish. This is like one of the top five stories that are mentioned in the Bible. The David and Goliath story. Goliath of course, the most renowned giant was the mighty Philistine, Philistine slain by David. Here is how he is described in scripture. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath, from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Okay, so I used my calculator. Eighteen inches is a cubit, and there were six of them. 18 times 6, 108 inches. Convert the inches into feet, that's 9 feet. Okay, we're talking about David and Goliath again here. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath, that's the giant, from Gath, whose height was 6 cubits and a span. That's 9 feet. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield-bearer went before him. I won't look that quote up. I'm not going to try and recount the David and Goliath story. Notice that Goliath was from Gath, which happened to be one of the three places where Anakim remained, according to Joshua. So, although he is not called one in 1 Samuel, it is possible that Goliath was a descendant of the Anakim who mixed with the Philistine population in that area. So he's a, he's a hybrid.
continuing on. There is some debate about Goliath's height due to the textual variance in ancient manuscripts. Most English translations how it follow the Masoretic text, enlisting the height at six cubits and a span, approximately nine feet nine. However, the Net Bible puts Goliath at a close to seven feet tall. The well, that's shorter, isn't it? So the Net Bible puts Goliath at close to seven feet tall. The the reason for the discrepancy is that the Masoretic text differs from the from some ancient texts, <coughs> according including the Septuagint and an ancient manuscript from among the Dead Sea Scrolls, labeled 4Q Sam subscript A, which lists Goliath height as four cubits and a span approximately six foot nine. Many modern scholars believe there is stronger textual support for the shorter Goliath, but while he is not specifically called a giant in this passage in Second Samuel, seems to identify Goliath as the giant, Rapha, from Gath. There are other details provided that make the six cubits and a span the more likely figure. For example, the sheer weight of his armaments required that he must have been of enormous size and strength. His coat of mail weighed, excuse me, his coat of mail weighed about 125 pounds, and just the tip of his spear was 15 pounds. This does not even take into account his helmet, armor on his legs, javelin, or sword. Also, I personally find it hard to believe that every member of Israel's army would have been terrified of someone who was six foot nine. I guess the author of this article is also six foot nine. Am I reading that right? There are many other details about the account of David and Goliath that are often overlooked. Most people assume David was a short young man when he fought against the giant, but the Bible is very clear that David was considered a mighty man of valor and a man of war prior to fighting Goliath. Okay, <clears throat> I will just try and wrap this up a little bit and get through this quicker. Other giants. The Bible mentions four more Philistine giants who were relatives of Goliath from the region of Gath. Second Samuel provides a more detailed account of these giants than the record of First Chronicles. But the latter passage does not provide some extra information. Excuse me, but the latter passage does provide some extra information that helps us make sense of the passage. The additional details from First Chronicles are provided in brackets. When the Philistines were at war against again with Israel, David and his servants with him went down and fought against the Philistines. And David grew faint. Then Ishbi Banab, who was one of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose bronze spear was three hundred shekels, who was bearing a new sword and thought he could kill David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, came to his aid and struck the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go out no more with us to battle, lest you quench the lamp of Israel. Now it happened afterward that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob, or Gezer. Then Sibachai, the Hushathite, killed Saph, or Sippai, who was one of the sons of the giant. Again, there was war at Gob with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jere Oregim, or Jer, the Beth Bethamite killed Lami, the brother of Goliath, the Gitite, the shaft of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Yet again there was war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature, who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in number, and he also was born to the giant. So when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimea, David's brother, killed him. These four were born to the giant in Gath, and fell by the hand of David, and by the hand of his servants, in Second Samuel. David's mighty men killed giants named Ishbi-Banab, Saph, Sippai, and Lami, 
as well as an unnamed giant with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. Each of these men could have descended from the remnant of Anakim that survived in the region of Gath, Gaza, and Ashdod. An Egyptian giant? Question mark. One of David's mighty men, Bana Baniah, the son of Jehoiada, defeated a large Egyptian man, and he killed an Egyptian, a man of great height, five cubits tall. Okay, I did the math. Uh, five cubits times 18. 18 is the number of inches in a cubit. That's 90 inches. 90 inches converts to seven and a half feet. And he killed an Egyptian, a man of great height, five cubits tall. In the Egyptian hand there was a spear like a weaver's beam, and he went down to him with a staff, wrested the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. Although he is often considered a giant, the Bible does not specifically identify this man as one, nor does it place this account with the ex exploits of David's other men who slayed giants, but it does, does provide his height as five cubits, approximately seven foot six. All these versions of the Bible and others insert the word great before height or stature, but great does not appear in the Hebrew. This may have been done for stylistic and readability purposes or because his height is provided later in the verse. Young's literal transla translation renders this verse in an almost perfect word-for-word -word match of the Hebrew, and he hath smitten the man, the Egyptian, a man of measure, five cubits, five by the cubit, and in the hand of the Egyptian is a spear like a beam of weavers. In the parallel parallel account given in 2 Samuel, in verse 23, the Egyptian is called a spectacular man in the New King James Version and an impressive man in the NASB. While modern man may think of a seven foot six man as a giant, it is intriguing that the Bible does not identify him as such. Perhaps this is a clue that those who are identi identified as giants were larger than the Egyptian slain by Benaiah. Another explanation for this omission is that many of the giants were called by their particular tribes, Anakim, Amim, etc. But the tall Egyptian is not said to belong to any of these giant groups. If that is the case, it is curious why the biblical writers would not simply use a generic term for giant, such as Rapha. Following these accounts, Second Samuel and First Chronicles, the giants fade from the pages of scripture other than the retrospective mention of the Amorites as giants in Amos 2 verses 9. I am going to stop it there. Uh, I probably will read this to myself, maybe make another video, but this is extra biblical references. Well, I don't want to get too carried away. Thanks for listening.